um, thank you very much all for coming. Thank you to our viewers on the internet afterwards. Um, as I said before, uh, I'm, I would like to explain for a couple of minutes how this happened to, to, uh, to become reality. Uh, I was studying at, at Canada, at the University of Toronto, where I met uh, Seth, and we were both PhD students at the University of Toronto. Uh, it was an impressive group of uh, graduate students, incredibly brilliant. Uh, and then I, I, I left uh, Canada, and I, I was in Spain for some five, six years, and I went to Villanova to work with, with uh, Lowell Gustafson. And then Lowell and I went together to this meeting of the American Political Science Association in Philadelphia. And there Seth was. Uh, and, and they have both been working on Thucydides. Seth uh, has just published his uh, doctoral thesis on Oxford University Press about Thucydides. And Lowell has been working on Thucydides too. And they, he knew, uh, Seth knew about Lowell uh, because he, of course, had read his book. So Seth was working uh, in Rome. Uh, Lowell was coming to the Francisco de Vitoria, so we could not not be making this this thing happening. Um, I I always try to uh, to teach international relations theory to my IR students, which is not very easy, uh, and I always try to make them understand that. Uh, the history of, po of political thought is relevant to international relations. Uh, why am I saying that this is difficult? It is difficult because political theory uh, has a relationship with their history that is more easy than uh, international relations theory. For example, when you study political theory, uh, you can perfectly, uh, it's perfectly normal to study political theories before the coming of political science as a discipline. It's impossible to study political theory without studying Plato, Tocqueville, or whatever. All these authors are before the coming of political science as a discipline. This is not the case in international relations. Uh, you consider international relations to start with the first great debate, and even theorists find a kind of strange to go and look and study the authors that have said something before uh, the First World War. Of course, some of them uh, take some Kant, uh, 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 some Kant statements and talk about democratic peace theory or things like that, but just just very superficially. Well, uh, I think Seth and Lowell are here to show us the contrary. Uh, this this uh, thinker to see this has very relevant things to say to you, IR students. And um, uh, I hope that you'll enjoy. These are the two best persons we could have for talking about to see today. So thank you so much for coming both. Thank you, Seth, for being here. You can start. So uh, thanks to all of you for having me here today uh, and to Guillermo for his very uh, kind introduction. I'm uh, pleased to be able uh, to share my research uh, with the Universidad Francisco de Vitoria community uh, and, and the online audience who may be watching. Uh, as you can tell, I, I don't use PowerPoint of any kind, uh, so I will endeavor to keep you awake and engaged uh, through personal magnetism, the terrifying specter of great power conflict, and ambient Thucydidean electricity. Uh, and if that seems to be failing, maybe I'll engage in frantic hand-waving. Um, but, but so joking aside, given the diver uh, potential diversity of today's crowd, uh, the presence of uh, faculty and students from a variety of different fields, uh, my own scholarship is interdisciplinary, uh, I've tried to craft a broadly accessible uh, and I hope interesting interdisciplinary talk about my research on Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, particularly as it pertains to the so-called Thucydides trap concept, a 2012 coinage of the American political scientist and foreign policy analyst Graham Allison of Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Uh, now, as some of you may know, the uh, very idea of a Thucydides trap is drawn from Thucydides' line about the inevitability of a Peloponnesian War, which occurs at 123.6 of the first book of his history, that is the book surrounding the origins of that great war. Allison maintains that the dynamic that Thucydides identified at play in the outbreak of that ancient war is presently at play in the U.S.-China relationship, and moreover, that it could all too easily lead to an unanticipated great power conflict. Uh, as Guillermo mentioned, for my own part, I've 
recently completed uh, a book entitled Thucydides on the Outbreak of War, Character and Contest, which has just been published by Oxford University Press, and which offers a new reading of Thucydides' account of the causes of the Peloponnesian War. Now, that book, I should note at the very outset, does not directly engage the Thucydides trap concept or literature. Instead, it is principally addressed to political scientists, political theorists, and classical scholars interested in 5th century Greece, and not, and perhaps maybe to some who are interested in ancient warfare more broadly, but it's not primarily directed to international relations scholars or public policy makers. But my own training is partly in international relations, and so this talk today represents an early stage of an ongoing effort to translate elements of my new interpretation of Thucydides into the IR and policymaking idiom. Uh, because I believe that certain of the arguments contained in my book have implications for how we should understand Thucydides as a theorist of international politics. Now, there's also another reason that I'm interested in the Thucydides trap exercise, and this is because the very notion of such a trap represents a test of the enduring value of Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, a subject to which I will soon return. Uh, now, to use the key translation of the line from 123.6 that Allison relies upon, and this is the line that is invariably quoted in these discussions, this is the Crawley translation, it was in Thucydides' opinion, quote, the growth of the power of Athens and the alarm or fear which this inspired in Sparta, which made war inevitable or necessary or compulsory, end quote. Now, political scientists often take uh, this authorial statement to be a kind of law-like generalization, a proto-social scientific theory about an interactive dynamic that generates war between rising powers or revisionist powers and ruling or status quo powers. In simple terms, a rising power inspires fear or apprehension in a status quo or relatively declining power or relatedly encroaches upon its perceived interests in intolerable ways, and this dynamic lights a fuse leading to war. Political communities, to say it all more simply, fight either to maintain the balance of power or to overturn it. Now, the Thucydidean line was first applied to the U.S.-China relationship by Allison in the Financial Times in 2012 in a piece entitled, The Thucyd Thucydides' Trap Has Been Sprung in the Pacific, and subsequently updated and expanded in a much-cited article in the Atlantic Monthly in 2015 entitled, The Thucydides' Trap, Are the U.S. and China Headed for War? Allison's book-length treatment of the subject destined for war, Can America and China Escape Thucydides' Trap, is presently forthcoming and will be out at the end of the month. In anticipation of its publication, Allison has published several interesting and provocative pieces in the National Interest, the Washington Post, among other venues. You will likely see him in the news on this particular subject and topic. The book itself is attracting major attention, and I would encourage all of you to take a glance at it when it does appear, as well as Allison's recent pieces, especially the national interest one, which offers three highly provocative and interesting scenarios that could lead to an unanticipated conflict between the United States and China. Uh, moreover, the book uh, has endorsements from several former U.S. Secretaries of Defense, the former Vice President Joe Biden, and Henry Kissinger, among various other uh, policy and academic luminaries. Now, importantly, Allison's Thucydides trap concept has not remained a mere academic trope. Both uh, President uh, Xi Jinping of China and former President Barack Obama have explicitly referenced it, denying or disavowing or qualifying the existence of the dynamic that Allison identifies. I am not yet aware of any Trump administration reference to this particular dynamic. So with that kind of broad framework in place, let me offer you the formal structure of my remaining uh, presentation today. So to talk about the Thucydides trap in an informed way, I want to first introduce you or perhaps reintroduce some of you to Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, second to offer Graham Allison's formulation of the Thucydides trap concept, third to sketch in compressed form my vision of Thucydides' account of the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, specifically as it pertains to the inevitability of this war, this being the most common translation of the classical uh, Greek word for necessity or compulsion, which is ananke and variance. And then fourth and finally, I want to bring the threads together to offer a slight reformulation of the Thucydides' trap concept, at least if fidelity to Thucydides is our primary objective, to put the Thucydides back into the trap, as it were. And in that context, I'll offer a concluding meditation on how Donald Trump and Xi Jinping may, in, may play into the dynamics under discussion. <laughs> 
So my remaining presentation will be roughly, I don't know, 35 minutes or so. Uh, maybe Lowell will kick me if I begin to go over. Um, and then I'd be happy to field your questions or perhaps endure your recriminations. Uh, if any of you are sitting next to a classicist and they appear to be on the verge of apoplexy, please console them gently. Some of my best friends are classicists. Um, so before turning to the Thucydides trap, I want to give you a framing sketch of the Peloponnesian War for those of you who may be unaware, perhaps the students among the audience, and then to outline my understanding of the purpose of Thucydides' work, a book which is arguably the greatest extant prose work from the great 5th century efflorescence in Greece, a masterpiece of classical political thought, and a revealing study of the first democracy at war, Athens, an imperial democratic city. As many of you will also know, the history is also understood to be a canonical book for the student of international politics. And indeed, I also believe it to be a kind of manual for citizen, soldiers, and statesmen. For our purpose, it is worth emphasizing that Thucydides is generally conceived of as the first scholar of international relations, avant la lettre. Thucydides, paleo-realist or ur-realist. Uh, as Lowell well knows, there is a virtual cottage industry of articles on what kind of realist Thucydides actually is. But first things first, what was the Peloponnesian War? So the war we call Peloponnesian, what historians today sometimes call the Second Peloponnesian War, this, the subject of Thucydides' life, life's work and the defining event of his life, was a 27-year conflict between the two preeminent city-states of ancient Greece, Athens and Sparta. It spanned the years 431 to 404 BC. It was a long war and an enormously destructive one. For our purposes today, it might best be compared to World War I in the scope and scale of its destruction. To give you just a very quick sense of the magnitude of that destruction, scholars have argued that Athens had around 60,000 citizen households in 431 BC at the beginning of the war. That's a high estimate. Ancient population numbers are notoriously difficult to figure out. But by the end of the war, Athens had only 15,000 citizen households remaining in 404, which is a low estimate. But think for a moment about the percentage loss of population in a single generation. So now we have at least a working sense of the magnitude of the conflict. Who were the war's two contestants, and what was the character of their contest? Well, in 5th century Greece, Sparta was the preeminent land power, the leader of the Peloponnesian League, a primarily defensive alliance of mainly oligarchical cities. Athens, by contrast, was the preeminent naval power and a democracy, the first democracy, a direct democracy, and so not a representative one like those today, something that we might call an illiberal democracy. Now, Athens, for her part, was outfitted with an unmatched navy, and because of her great walls, walls that stretched down to encircle her military harbor, the Piraeus, the city was unassailable by land, a fortified island. Athens was then a naval empire, and she dominated the islands of the Aegean, while also harboring a thirst and indeed a talent for imperial expansion. Now, in addition to the, comparative, the comparative material advantages of the side, their hard power, as we might say now for those of you who study international relations, the cities also had deeply opposing characters, a theme that I want to return to since my own research has been bound up with the domestic character of regimes in Thucydides' history, for reasons which I'll shortly elaborate. In terms of the character of the city, of the, of the two cities, whereas Spartan power was long-standing and Sparta a conservative or maintaining power, Athenian power was relatively new and Athens was a progressive city, an acquisitive city, a daring and expansionistic power. So what then is Thucydides' enterprise in, in recreating this war? What is his authorial intention? Why did he write it up for posterity? Now, contrary to what some of you may think from my free use of the title, The History of the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides did not write a work entitled A History. This is simply the work handed down to us by posterity. Indeed, in my view at least, uh, one unsurprisingly not shared by many ancient historians, the conceptual freighting that attends this word history risks obscuring the character of the Thucydidean project as Thucydides himself seems to have understood that project. For his part, Thucydides writes, quote, that he intends his book to be a possession for all time, this presumably on the basis of the fact that the future will resemble the past. Okay? Well, how would a past thinker assert that his work would be a possession for all time or for everlasting, to use Thomas Hobbes's felicitous translation of that particular line? 
Well, Thucydides asserts that he has written his history for, quote, whosoever wishes to examine the truth of the things that have happened and of the like things that will happen again according to the nature of human beings. That's kata to anthropinon in the Greek. So in other words, the essence of the things that have happened and will happen again is the human thing, toanthropinon, which runs through past, present, and future times. There is then some bright recurrent thread of human nature that runs through the customary or cultural differences that characterize various historical epochs, or such would appear to be the Thucydidean suggestion. So history as a singular chain of events does not and cannot repeat itself, and yet at the same time, the individual episodes of Thucydides' history, or at least some of the individual episodes he recreates, I believe are intended to disclose more universal or representative or characteristic phenomena. So, to bring it to our example today, Thucydides' account of the causes of the Peloponnesian War, in my view, is intended to shed light on the permanent human causes of war. The chain of events Thucydides chooses to depict in his first book, the fuse snaking toward the powder keg of the Peloponnesian War, or more precisely, the manner in which Thucydides depicts this particular chain of events, is intended to bring out what is characteristic or representative about the causes of that ancient war. On the basis of what I have just said so far, you can perhaps see why I earlier remarked that the Thucydides trap is a test of Thucydides himself. And indeed, this is precisely what interests me most about Thucydides in contemporary politics. Is he really relevant? Is there really such a thing as the Thucydides trap? And if so, what is its character? Or to frame the question somewhat differently, how would we apply a Thucydidean frame to the US-China relationship? And what would such a frame reveal about the likely pathways to conflict? OK, now, before sketching Graham Allison's version of the trap concept, uh, for the purpose of full disclosure uh, and a little anecdotal color, uh, I should admit to having a personal connection to Graham Allison. Um, I worked for him a number of years ago in a research capacity at Harvard's Kennedy School. Uh, and in recent years, we've been in touch about Thucydides off and on. Uh, and in particular, we have discussed uh, some of my views on the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, again, the subject of my research, given he has been working on similar themes. This said, my own view of the Thucydides trap is a little different than Allison's, though I should tell you that I'm broadly sympathetic to his efforts, uh, although we can talk about some of that in the question period. Uh, indeed, at his suggestion, I published an op-ed in the National Interest in October of 2015, where I offered my own view of the Thucydides trap concept, and this talk represents a kind of expanded version of that much shorter and more compressed argument. All right, so let's now turn to Allison's Thucydides trap. In the already noted 2012 Financial Times piece, Allison exhorted the United States and China uh, to avoid Thucydides' trap, by which he meant a series of events that could lead to an unintended war between a rising power, China, and a ruling one, the United States. Allison, moreover, maintained that the two countries' ability to avoid this trap is, quote, the defining question about global order in the decades ahead. And, and as you will know from those of you who study international relations, questions about the character of international order, questions about whether we're moving out of uh, a unipolar world in the direction to a, of a multipolar one, these are the kind of big think questions that international relations scholars like to engage in. Allison is entering that debate with an exhortation to policymakers on both sides to be alive both sides being the United States and China, to be alive to this particularly dangerous and important dynamic for the shape of international order in the 21st century. Now, during the Cold War, as some of you will know, uh, and fewer of you will remember given the students here, Thucydides was frequently mapped on to the great power rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. With the Soviet Union, a garrison state with superior land power in the role of modern Sparta, and the United States, a democracy with a true blue water navy in the role of ancient Athens. Now, in many, sen in, 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 uh, in many respects, this makes more intuitive sense than China as Athens and the United States as Sparta, as it is in Allison's framing, a subject to which I'll shortly return. Thucydides, for his part, is sometimes considered a classical realist, along with, say, Hans Morgenthau, who some of you may have read, which to say he's understood to be an analyst of political life who finds the causes of war and conflict largely within human nature itself, which is what IR scholars sometimes call a first image claim. But Thucydides' work has also been appropriated by neorealists, who maintain that his treatment of the causes of war is, in fact, a structural argument, one rooted in the wider distribution of power or capabilities. Or at Kenneth Waltz, the father of neorealism calls a third image claim, 
Now, in this last vein, Thucydides has often been claimed by proponents of something called hegemonic stability theory or power transition theory, which seek in part to explain great power war. Now, the latest and most popular version is Allison's Thucydides trap. In other words, it's just important to point this out, Thucydides has been understood as a power transition theorist, or the first power transition theorist, before Allison's application of Thucydides to the US-China relationship. Allison, then, essentially has injected what has previously gone by the academic name power transition theory into mainstream public policy debates about the US-China relationship under the catchy rubric of a Thucydides trap. Now, importantly, Allison's argument goes well beyond Thucydides' history. He argues that the peaceful rise of China would defy the historical odds, which is to say that he introduces an empirical claim on the basis of historical case studies about the causes of great power war. He and his Belfer Center team had begun a Thucydides, project, a Thucydides trap project to track instances of conflict between ruling powers and the rising ones that threatened to displace them. And they have identified 16 such cases over the past 500 years. In 12, according to Allison and his team's interpretation of these cases, the outcome was war. You can explore these cases in the attendant methodology on the Belfer Center website if any of you are interested. Now, in the Washington Monthly in June of 2016, a piece entitled, a clever title, The Thucydides Claptrap appeared, where the constructivist IR scholar, who some of you may know, Ned LeBeau, who has himself written extensively on Thucydides, along with a noted classicist, Daniel Tompkins, rejected Allison's Thucydides trap concept completely, largely by rejecting Allison's reliance on the word inevitable in the line I have already quoted several times. LeBeau, for his part, has a 2010 Cambridge book, Why Nations Fight, which offers case studies about the origins of modern war. He comes to a very different conclusion than Allison, and I should just mention in this context that he offers a broader critique of power transition theory. I should note in this context that I'm not in a position to evaluate or adjudicate the empirical evidence about the relative historical incidents of war between rising powers and ruling ones. I haven't studied Allison's cases. But with regard to the Thucydides, I can tell you that I disagree with LeBeau and Tompkins' interpretation of our key line at 123.6. They maintain that the word frequently translated as inevitability or necessity or compulsion, this is the Greek word ananke, is really best translated as pressured, a kind of weaker formula. But I think the way Thucydides uses the term is stronger than that. Now, my book offers a much longer justification of my interpretation or inevitability or necessity in Thucydides, but I'll return to that issue in a moment. But Graham Allison, for his part, he doesn't really intend the Thucydides trap as an intervention in a rarefied debate among academic political scientists. He has bigger fish to fry. He's trying to speak directly to US and Chinese policymakers. But why speak to policymakers if war is inevitable? Right? You can't change anything. Why would you even have that conversation in the first place? They're busy people. Right? They want to talk about things they can change. So Allison does this, of course, because he doesn't actually believe war is inevitable, but rather the likelihood of war is greater than the principal actors realize, maybe even far greater, and that policymakers on both sides would do well to reflect upon this fact. U.S. PACOM, Pacific Command, as many of you will know, is the largest U.S. military deployment. While Obama, in the latter years of his presidency, initiated a rebalance or pivot toward the Pacific. Incidentally, this was to be part of the, strateg the grand strategy of George W. Bush uh, and his administration prior to the attacks of September uh, 11, 2001, where everything became about the war on terror. So Allison's exhortation for the United States and China to avoid a Thucydides trap then, and his own strategic use of the language of a possible war's inevitability is then rooted in his desire to focus the minds of the principal actors on the clear and present dangers of war. And in this effort, he has been successful. In late 2015, Thucydides loomed large over the summit between President Obama and President Xi. On September 22nd, 2015, President Xi remarked, quote, there is no such thing as the Thucydides trap in the world. You can imagine my excitement when he referenced the Thucydides trap. But should major countries time and again make the mistake of strategic miscalculation, they might create such traps for themselves, end quote. Two days later, President Obama remarked that he doesn't believe in a Thucydides trap or in the inevitability of war between the US and China. Instead, he formally announced, quote, the United States welcomes the rise of a China that is peaceful, stable, prosperous, and a responsible player in global affairs. Well, who wouldn't, 
But on the basis of my interpretation of Thucydides, at least, she and Obama get the character of the Thucydides trap wrong. Now, they get the character of the trap wrong because they interpret it as a third image claim or as an argument about a shift in the balance of power between status quo powers and revisionist ones. A series of dynamics somehow external to the actors, right? The actors are forced to do this or that by outside factors. But these third image claims are fundamentally underdetermined with regard to explaining how structural stresses, which may well be the product of the shifting balance of power, can lead to the very miscalculation referenced by President Xi. Now, Allison's recent piece, a very recent one in the national interest, and elements of his book project more generally, address this deficiency to some extent by exploring how various sparks involving Taiwan or South Korea or North Korea or Japan could spiral in the direction of unintended conflict. Okay, having now given you a sense of Allison's trap concept, what does my new interpretation of the cause of the Peloponnesian War offer us with regard to the Thucydides trap dynamic? How does it help us get some purchase on this particularly important relationship, the US-China relationship? So I need to offer a quick sketch of my account. Uh, now, in the book, I demonstrate at great length that Thucydides' account of necessity or inevitability, in fact, points toward the characters of the Athenian and Spartan regimes disclosing a Thucydidean preoccupation with nature and convention, which are 5th century BC intellectual themes, and which for our purposes today loosely correspond to nature and nurture in our contemporary language. So what does that mean? Well, with regard to the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, Athens is an expansionistic power, Sparta the status quo one. When the strategic prerogatives of an expanding acquisitive power collide with the abiding interests of a maintaining one, at that moment, according to Thucydides, a Peloponnesian war becomes somehow necessary. But crucially, necessity in Thucydides' first book pre proves bound up with regime character. It is not entirely external to the actors. Okay? Stated another way, the character of rising Athenian power is just as important to the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War as is the character of Spartan apprehension. Thucydidean necessity, to put the point on our interpretive matter, is bound up with what IR scholars call the second image, with regime character. So let me explain in just a moment. Okay, throughout his book, Thucydides characteristically disarticulates the elements of political decision making. What does that mean? Well, when actors make decisions, just think in common sense terms. When actors make decisions, they forever bring attitudes, plans, or dispositions to their circumstances. In every decision, every decision you make, whether it's about lunch or whether something more substantive, right? In every decision, we observe the encounter between some antecedent disposition and a concrete circumstance. At any and every moment, then, the circumstances matter, what we might call the strategic positionality of the actors vis-a-vis -vis one another in the IR context. But so too do the characteristic dispositions or attitudes or beliefs that the actors bring to their circumstances, which is to say the actors own perceptions of their strategic circumstances, which are themselves rooted in background conceptions of the national interest in the IR context. To use a simple example for the purposes of illustration, a cautious person brings a cautious demeanor to her circumstances and indeed conceives of her interest in cautious ways, whereas a daring person brings a daring attitude and conceives of his interest in some more daring manner. The circumstances faced by the actors could be identical, but the actors themselves bring something very different to the table, which shapes their perceptions of the distinctive necessities or imperatives that they face at any given moment. Now, Thucydides, for his part, maintains that not only do individuals act on the basis of identifiable psychological drives, traits, or dispositions, the key ones for Thucydides are security, for honor, and for profit, but crucially, so do political communities. Cities or states evince identifiable corporate characters or tempers, perhaps even tragic flaws, and here he may be drawing on the template of the Greek stage, personifying cities as characters in the global drama of international politics. Now, more simply stated, Thucydides suggests that political communities behave in identifiable ways. Athens, you will recall, is a daring power, and Sparta a cautious one. And so the city's behavior reflects these dispositions. 
If political communities do, in fact, evince characteristic behavior, characteristic corporate tendencies, then we can speak of typical Athenian behavior, typical Spartan behavior, or indeed of characteristic American behavior in the South China Sea, or characteristic Chinese behavior with regard to the East China Sea. Athens is daring, Sparta is cautious. Again, these dispositions are independent of the strategic positionality of the cities within the larger international system of ancient Greece. Solely in terms of the balance of power, Athens is the rising power and Sparta the status quo one. But crucially, one could easily imagine a cautious riser and a daring maintainer. As opposed to a daring riser, Athens, and a cautious maintainer, Sparta. And indeed, this first dynamic would seem to capture the US-China relationship better than the more simplistic mapping or trans transposition of Athens onto China and Sparta onto the United States. In the case of China and the US, the rising power, China, is more Spartan, to speak anachronistically, while the maintaining power is more Athenian. And if Donald Trump's concrete actions vis-a-vis -vis China are as inflammatory as his rhetoric has sometimes been, this could have serious implications for the US-China relationship. So let me return for a moment to the issue of necessity or inevitability. This, again, the Greek word ananke. If you trace out all of the usages of ananke's in Thucydides' first book, and you'll be happy to know I have done all of this for you so you don't have to, <laughs> you discover that the term refers to the point of contact between a city's corporate character and its circumstances. In other words, on my reading, uh, and Lowell might have a different reading. People argue about these things. We can talk about those debates in the question period. But on my reading, Thucydides and necessity is something like the imperatives of the national interest as the political community in question understands those interests. Necessity, then, relates to the ends that political communities seek, to their conception of the advantageous things, to use Thucydidean language, or to the community's perceptions of its strategic interest in both the short and the long term. In other words, necessity is bound up with how actors understand their own strategic environments, which is nourished by a background conception of the national interest, itself a more general or antecedent disposition, that the nation would bring to its concrete circumstances, okay? And that those national interests are themselves informed by the deeper temper or character of the individual or community in question. Let me try to sort of bring all of those threads together in what I hope is a clear way. So a, a citizen, a soldier, or a statesman, an actor, or a community, understands a particular action to be necessary or compulsory because that actor believes they have no other choice or indeed no better or more rational choice than that course of action. It does not mean that other actions or op sorry, it does not mean that other options are not are not nominally open to the actors, but rather that the actor can't or won't entertain those other options. That's what it means to speak about inevitability or necessity in the distinctly human sense. So to apply this to the Peloponnesian War, and then I promise it will loop back to China, I promise. To apply this to the Peloponnesian War, war became necessary when Athens and Sparta understood themselves to have no alternative to it. Now this would maybe be a banal statement if Thucydides had not also deftly revealed those key decisions and their consequences whereby the actors progressively arrived at the knife's edge of the Peloponnesian War. So one of the things I think I have proved in this new monograph is that Thucydides' first book programmatically surfaces the distinctive necessities, the imperatives of the national interest, of the main players, including those of middle-rate powers. War became inevitable, in other words, when the actors themselves conceived of no better or more reasonable course of action than conflict, the result of a process by which the perceived range of available options had progressively narrowed, ultimately leaving only the option for war remaining. The objective, or sorry, to use modern language maybe, war became a path dependency for both Athens and Sparta. The objective necessity for the Great War was then the product of the subjective necessities of the key actors. Now, this obviously abridges and flattens out a more complicated story, but it does mean that the argument that Thucydides' claim about the inevitability of war is solely a third image or structural claim must be mistaken, or at best, only partially part of this story. So I need to make a final conceptual point and then turn more fully to the U.S.-China relationship on the basis of this discussion. In addition to showing how Athens and Sparta differently conceive of their interests, 
Thucydides makes it clear that the two principal cities also had opposing visions of their city's place in the world. Or perhaps more precisely, differing visions of the world itself. Today, we might call these disparate cultural outlooks or maybe more loosely what Huntington provocatively called a clash of civilizations. These deeper background views of the Athenians of the Spartans naturally informed these cities' conceptions of their strategic interests. To deploy the helpful language of IR constructivism, identities and interests are bound up with one another, while the history of a city's foreign policy shapes both. To put Thucydides in the ill-fitting clothing of modern frameworks, one of the best things about Thucydides is that he precedes all of our disciplinary divisions. One of the worst things about Thucydides is he precedes all of our disciplinary divisions. But to put him in the ill-fitting clothing of those modern distinctions, he is a realist, a second image theorist, but also a kind of constructivist. So what does all of that mean for the Thucydides trap? Well, you'll recall the quotation about the Thucydides trap by President Xi Jinping. Let me repeat it. Quote, there is no such thing as the Thucydides trap in the world, but should major countries time and again make the mistakes of strategic miscalculation, they might create such traps for themselves, end quote. In my view, that is the trap, strategic calculation or miscalculation. So how should we as analysts and observers of political life think about the United States and China if we wish to grasp how the actors might avoid a serious, series of dangerous strategic miscalculations? Well, the first thing to say is something that I've already said. Regime character really matters. Now, for many years, China has been a conservative power with regard to its foreign policy. Here we might think of Deng's hide and bide strategy, riding the proverbial tiger of its enormous domestic modernization efforts while steadily growing its capabilities, helped in recent years by its shocking and enviable double-digit economic growth rates, which show some signs of slowing. The United States, more generally, and this will surprise no one in this room, has been the far more daring or aggressive power in terms of its foreign policy, taking advantage of its clear hegemony in the Western world to project power far from home to the far corners of the world. In the South China Sea, U.S. forces are deployed, deployed in China's backyard, while China is energetically expanding its power and control over the islands surrounding it, over which it views itself as having a sovereign claim. Its militarization of the Spratly chain is a key example of this. But again, this is China's backyard. Chinese aircraft carriers are not cruising the Gulf of Mexico, and it is doubtful the United States would be cheerful about a deployment of that sort. China's A2D2, its area access, area denial strategy, is geared toward pushing U.S. forces out, or perhaps more precisely, having the capability to significantly hinder U.S. naval operations in the South China Sea, perhaps to prevent the United States from aiding Taiwan quickly enough in the event of some future conflict between Taiwan and mainland China. That is surely their desire, to have sufficient capabilities to deny the United States access to certain areas in the event of a conflict, whether or not there is to be a conflict or not. That is surely their goal. Now, for my part, I would not be surprised if China were ultimately to implement an Air Defense Identification Zone, ADIZ, in the South China Sea, as it did in 2013 in the East China one. This zone covers the disputed Sankaku Islands with both China and Japan claim. Air, identification, air defense identification zones, for their part, are generally implemented over only undisputed territory. And so there was real outcry over China's decision. To return to the Thucydidean frame, we need to recognize that the regime characters of Athens and Sparta are at least for the moment, and I'll talk about why the for the moment is there, in the cases of the United States and China. To speak of a Thucydides trap in a broad sense, or to think critically about how war might occur between rising and ruling powers, I think it might help us, we might get more analytical purchase over these issues, to try to map out situations where we have a cautious riser and a cautious maintainer, Second, situations in which we have a daring riser and a daring maintainer. Third, situations in which we have a daring riser and a cautious maintainer. And fourth and finally, circumstances in which we have a cautious riser and a daring maintainer, with the last capturing something of the U.S.-China dynamic. Although I should note in this context that China has become more and more assertive in recent years and almost assuredly aims for regional hegemony over the medium to long term. With regard to the schema just outlined, my strong intuition, which is to say it's not terribly empirically grounded, that's code, 
My strong intuition is that the most dangerous dynamic with regard to the prospect of war over the changing balance of power between the United States and China and of strategic miscalculation is a circumstance where you have a daring slash aggressive maintainer and a daring slash aggressive riser. Now, to turn to current events, if Xi Jinping comes out of the critical 19th Party Conference in Beijing this fall with a strengthened domestic hand, this is a major political event in China, I would expect China to take a progressively more aggressive or assertive stance across several issue areas. For Xi's China dream slogan, as some of you may know, strongly resembles Trump's Make America Great Again slogan, both of which argue for a return to past historical greatness through national strength. So as China's sphere of influence expands and interferes more directly with the prerogatives of Japan or of Taiwan, these political communities will likely turn to the United States for security assistance or for increasing security assistance. So this will be the only way to counterbalance rising Chinese strength. Now, as one of my colleagues who works on East Asia said to me recently, one interesting development which I share with you in the context of the Trump administration's policy toward Asia could be its support for a more militarized Japan which would act as a hedge against a rising China. An interesting suggestion and something to follow. In that context, it is perhaps not accidental that Japan's Shinzo Abe was one of the first leaders that Trump met at Maro Lago, the so-called Winter White House. Now, as some of you will know, alliance politics produced the first sparks of the Peloponnesian War. If we wish to be on the lookout for a Thucydides trap, then entangling alliances are assuredly key flashpoints to watch. To say nothing of the rapidly rising tensions on the Korean Peninsula and the possibility that Kim Jong-un will have an intercontinental ballistic missile, missile capable of reaching the U.S. with a nuclear payload before the end of Trump's first term, the obtainment of which would be a so-called game changer and the prevention of which is clearly a major American strategic priority. Clearly a major American strategic priority. Now, China, for its part, has no interest in an unstable or collapsing North Korean regime, but it's also important to note it has no strategic interest in the end of a pro-Chinese regime on at least one half of the Korean Peninsula. With regard to North Korea, Allison, in this recent uh, national interest piece, has raised the terrifying spectacle, uh, cheerful possibilities here, of the United States and Chinese special forces meeting in a track race to secure North Korea's small nuclear arsenal in the event of the regime's collapse. I guarantee you there are plans to try to secure those arsenals on both the US and Chinese side. And yet, after a, a certain amount of American saber rattling, US Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has recently remarked that with regard to North Korea, all options are on the table. This includes presumably regime change, the precise reason Kim Jong-un has been so intent on developing both nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities, precisely because he saw what happened to Muammar Gaddafi in Libya and is concerned about regime change, right? And yet Trump recently tweeted just the other day that if the situation were right, he would be honored to meet Kim Jong-un. So on that note, let's turn to the highly unpredictable Donald J. Trump. Now, among those who defend Trump, and I'm winding my way toward a conclusion so, so others can speak, but among those who defend Trump, some have pointed to Richard Nixon's madman theory of foreign policy, whereby political irrationality is deployed for rational purposes, to confound the expectation of one's rivals or enemies, and thereby to shift the parameters of future accommodation through the projection of uncertainty. Acting like a madman, in other words, can change the status quo by reshaping the expectations or strategic calculations of various actors. Now, such a strategy is predicated upon reaping the solid benefits of unpredictability and indeed on the other actors being saner than you are. But of course, there can also be uh, significant strategic costs to unpredictability, particularly in highly charged circumstances where the other players have unambiguous red lines. And moreover, if Kim Jong-un of North Korea, to give a pertinent example in the context of our conversation, if he has also embraced a madman strategy, then the more general embrace of brinksmanship can lead to a terrifying security dilemma whereby each madman attempts to exceed the other in madness itself until all of us go over the proverbial cliff. Now on the campaign trail, Trump used a great deal of heated rhetoric about China, mainly on the economic front, 
Uh, but he even went so far, as some of you will recall, to take a phone call from the president of Taiwan, a truly unpre an unprecedented act for an American president-elect, and one that, at least for a hot moment, called into question America's longstanding commitment to the One China policy. Now, Trump appears to have walked back this symbolic provocation, but the issue of Taiwan is surely a big Chinese red line. Indeed, one real question we need to ask about American foreign policy in the age of Trump is whether Trump himself has a full grasp of the symbolic import of certain foreign policy actions. As someone teaching American foreign policy this semester, I can tell you that one of the recurrent questions that we have, my class, as observers of the Trump administration, is who actually speaks for that administration on any given issue. For example, on the economic side, and this has implications for the U.S.-China relationship with regard to a potential trade war or arguments about growing American economic nationalism or protectionism, but with regard to who speaks for the Trump administration, it's not clear at all whether or not the economic nationalists within his administration will win out ever over the more conventional corporate business as usual Goldman Sachs types. In the security space, Trump has offered highly mixed signals. He has recently made several glowing statements about Xi Jinping in the broader context of the tensions involving North Korea. This after their recent Mar-a-Lago summit. You may have heard about it because in the context of bombing Syria, Trump mentioned the delectable chocolate cake they were having over dinner. But also Steve Bannon, the former head of Breitbart News, whose influence in the White House is presently unclear. Some claim it's declining with the hiring of McMaster as the national security advisor. Bannon has previously remarked that the United States will go to war over China's militarization of the Spratly chain and China's rising power in the South China Sea within, say, 10 years. And indeed, under Xi, China has been developing a military presence on these uninhabited islands in contravention of his own public statements to the, common, the contrary. China, in other words, is creating proverbial facts on the ground or facts on the sea, as it were. So in addition to these potential Trumpian provocations and Xi's own more assertive policy stance, and here we move in the direction, or I want to move in the direction of suggesting that if China has heretofore been a cautious maintainer, and the United States, sorry, China has been a cautious riser and the United States has been a cautious maintainer, there's some signs or there's some reason to think China may increasingly become a daring riser, which again would increase the chances of the kind of strategic miscalculations we've talked about. And this is the possibility that China will become increasingly more assertive if and as the Chinese Communist Party begins to rely more heavily on a nationalistic or jingoistic rhetoric toward outsiders or foreigners as a means of creating domestic unity at home. Now this, you will recall, is one argument as to why China has heretofore been so cautious. The regime fears rocking the foreign policy boat given its own tremendous domestic modernization efforts. I mean, the largest internal migration in world history. I mean, the country is experiencing enormous change. And these very high levels of economic growth are absolutely essential for the Communist Party to maintain control. Should that growth rate begin to slip, you might see other means that the regime would engage in to try to maintain domestic control. Now, one way to do this, right, is foreign policy adventurism or a hardline foreign policy stance in the face of enemies abroad and indignities to the national honor. That is surely one way of unifying people behind a regime, particularly when the media is state controlled. Okay? Now, Graham Allison, for his part, to return to him for a moment, he does not advocate that either the United States or China abandon its core national interests. No policymaker would do that. Instead, to use my formulation, I think what he wants is for both powers to be fundamentally cautious. He wants the United States to intentionally and self-consciously adopt the role of a cautious maintainer, and he wants China intentionally and self-consciously to adopt the role of a cautious riser, since it is this dynamic that will give the, the actors the best chance of weathering the structural frictions that will come in the coming years and decades, and that will give birth to those circumstances that could lead to strategic miscalculation. Now, such a policy, if policymakers were to embrace it, would require very clear lines of communication between the United States and China, along with a deep grasp of the other side's vision of the world, its perception of the evolving strategic circumstances, and its red lines. One major concern in this context with regard to the Trump administration is the question of whether or not the proverbial right hand knows what the left hand is doing. 
In the event of some crisis with China, ill-timed tweets or the lack of clear communication could lead to various to very dangerous miscommunication indeed. So let me just say by way of conclusion to sort of bring it all together uh, and then to turn things over to Lowell and, and then to your questions, uh, I, I hope I've broadly persuaded you in this sort of compressed presentation. There's much of interest in Thucydides' history, despite the fact that he precedes political science as a discipline by many millennia. Uh, and that the work does, in fact, provide illuminating ways of thinking about why states go to war or indeed how pathways to conflict develop, which can inform the sorts of analytic questions that we can use to interrogate concrete foreign policy relationships or cases, like the very important U.S.-China relationship, which will surely shape the international political order in the decades to come. So thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you, Seth. That was a brilliant and engaging uh, presentation, so I really, really appreciate that. And, and thank you, uh, Guillermo, for organizing this. And as long as I've got you for a few minutes, I also have to thank Guillermo and, and Adrian and everyone here at, uh, at Francisco de Vitoria for a wonderful opportunity to be here at this university over the spring. It's, 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 it's been a fantastic uh, experience. My wife and I have fallen in love with Madrid and all the places we've gone to visit in, in, in Spain. It, it's really, it's been, it's, it's my first time in Spain, and it's been absolutely a, a, a pleasure in, in, in every way. So I, I really appreciate uh, all of that. And uh, I have to thank Guillermo because as he, he was in my position in, this, in the fall. He was teaching at my university at Villanova and did a great job, and we, we really enjoyed having him there. So thanks for, uh, for all of that. And thank you all for, uh, for, for, for being here. Um, well, if, 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 I don't know if you've ever gotten the chance to read Thucydides. It's a really long book. You know, it goes on for, depending on the, the, which version you use. It, it rambles on for six or seven hundred pages. You know, he spent almost his whole adult life writing this thing, and he never really finished it. You know, I mean, you, you, you know, it, things go on even when you're ready to die. And unfortunately, he sort of died before he finished it. It's a very unsatisfying conclusion uh, to the book. It doesn't all wrap up nicely and neatly at, at the end. And, and so you're left sort of wondering, how does this all hang together? What's the point uh, of this thing? Well, it just it, it, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to do that. It's one of those books that almost everybody refers to. Uh, and for good reason, not a lot of people read it because it's a real commitment of time to do that. But it's worth it uh, to, to, to actually make your way through this very long uh, project that he set himself uh, out for. And, and remember, try to put yourself in his shoes just a little bit. He's living in one of the great cities of, of this classic civilization, and it all falls apart. I, Greece almost destroys itself because of this war. There is nothing than that sort of an experience that forces you to question all of the nice assumptions you had had about life and think seriously about what are the realities here that characterize who we are as, 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 as humans. Uh, and, and that the conditions that he lived through forced him to think very seriously about this. And he didn't think just independently. He didn't go off by himself all by and, and try to imagine his own world uh, in, independently. Instead, he was engaged in a constant process of discussion. As you read the book, what you realize is it's, it's, it's constantly a, a dis, a, a, an account of, of debates within the cities, different groups within the cities, either formally or informally debating what should, what should they do, what, what is necessary for for them to do. Uh, and then there are formal diplomatic negotiations between representatives of different cities as they get together and debate about what they should do in response to each other. And then there's some minutely described events, usually battles. You know, if, if you like military history and you like to count hoplites and numbers of types of vessels, you know, this is, this is your book. So he's got action and debate and different groups debating, and he's trying to place all, and, and of course he also says, even if he wasn't there to hear the debate, he sort of makes up the debate if, that he thinks, you know, 
pr should have taken place even if it didn't. But uh, so, so he's not being a strict, you know, uh, modern journalist in that sense. He's not always looking for two uh, verifiable sources for, uh, for, for what he heard. But it's probably what they should have said, and that's what he would have said if he was in uh, the debate. But in any case, he's trying to place all of these things together. And he's trying to think through them so that he can offer us, as, as Seth was saying, a lasting possession. Something that lasts. It's, he's not just giving us an account for his own specific time. He is self-consciously trying to engage the future. He would be delighted to know that here we are, 2,500 years later, seriously discussing his book, but he wouldn't be surprised. He would say, well, of course you are. Uh, that's what makes my work worth my time because I'm engaged. I'm not just trying to think through, through these things for myself. I'm not even trying to just persuade my own compatriots of, of anything in particular. I'm in fact trying to engage a discussion over the long term. And isn't that one of the great pleasures of being here at a university like Francisco de Vitoria, that you are engaged in these millennia old discussions um, in, in which you're asking a, a, a couple of questions such as, you know, what did, what did Thucydides mean by that? And Seth was trying to get at that. The, how did the fifth century before Christ in Greece, how were they thinking of these uh, issues? You know, what, what was the approach that they used? How did they translate their words? And then what do we want to impose on those words? You know, th this word inevitability is such a crucial one to be thinking of. And I, and I really applaud Seth's uh, unpacking of that word and trying to place that in the framework of how the Greeks would have been thinking about it, as opposed to maybe how we use our modern scientific period to impose a meaning on what inevitability means, as if the Thucydides trap is like a law of modern physics, a, a law of gravity, where this leads to that, sort of irrespective of all of that complex thought that Seth was, was, was talking about. Um, so, so one of the first questions that, that we bring to bear as we try to work through a text like this is, what did he mean by that? And that means we've got to know the way that they were thinking, the historical circumstances uh, of, uh, of, of, of all of the, of, of the book. The, the other question is, because it is self-consciously meant to be a lasting possession, and things have changed. Our world here, 2,500 years later in Spain, is quite a bit different than it was back then uh, in, in Greece. So, so we then ask, what does it say to us? It's, we're not just interested in Thucydides for its historical value, although that's really interesting and it's really important to ask what did he mean at his time in his culture, at his point in history? What did he mean by that? It's also important for us to say, what does it mean for us now? Because we're living in different circumstances with a whole different intellectual framework, but it resonates with us when we read it. We get engaged by it. We're, we find it gripping. Uh, it, it speaks to us because he's right. The conditions are in a certain level the same for us as it was for him. So we can't make the translation easily or quickly or uncritically, which is why we need those uh, classicists to, to look very carefully at the meanings of, of the words as they were understood uh, at, the, uh, at their time. But we also say, how does it apply in our time. That's what Graham Allison is doing. That's what a lot of people, Thomas Hobbes did that in also a very different circumstance, although perhaps similar. I mean, basically England was falling apart in a civil war during Hobbes's time, and, and he too was asking what really is politics when, when it seems as though the ground is being pulled out from under my, uh, my, my feet. Um, uh, so, so we we have this effort to try to understand Thucydides in his own terms, 
and to ask what does it mean for us as other people have done at other times. And, and, and so Seth was talking about, for example, in the Cold War, how we sort of saw ourselves in this book. Who's who? I, and we always like to do that when we watch the, a movie or a TV show. What character seems to be like me? Who, who, do, who am I in, in that particular uh, series or whatever it is? Who are we in this series? Uh, and during the Cold War, we sort of read the book and we, we knew who we were, uh, we Americans. We were Athens. Af Athens was the great classical democratic uh, so, uh, you know, uh, power in, uh, in, in, in ancient Greece. That's what we were. We were the Democrats. Uh, and, and they were a naval power. Well, we used to be sort of isolated, but now we're connected to the world because of our naval and air forces. So, so we're Athens, right? And, and who's Sparta? Who's a great land power and sort of authoritarian and rigid, you know, mar armies marching around kind of power? Well, who else but the Soviet Union? So, so we knew who was who uh, in that. Or maybe a little bit before that, a century before that. Uh, it must have been Britain who was Athens, right? They were the democratic power. They ruled the seas, and they were the great naval power. And, and, and it was Napoleon who was the great land power, who had a great army who was marching all over Europe. And so, so we, we sort of uh, uh, transpose our current situation, and we try to see ourselves in this, or we try to use the book to try to understand our, our current situation. And it strikes me that that's a good thing to do. But it's a dangerous thing to do. Because as, as Seth was mentioning, all of a sudden it's different. Now, if there is an analogy, we're, we're not Athens anymore. We're, we're the kind of ruling power. We're the Spartan uh, power. And, and China's Athens, but it doesn't seem so democratic. And it doesn't seem to be ruling a naval empire. But it is the rising power. So, so in, 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 who's who in the plot now? Uh, but we're, we're still doing the same thing the previous periods have done. We're reading the book. And we're saying, how do we see ourselves in this book? What is this book saying to us to help us better understand what our current situation is? That's the value of, of engaging in, 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 in this millennia-long discussion of how, how does reading the past and reading these classical books help us better frame some of our debates now? How can we better think about what our problems are and the different ways that we have interpreted them in the past to give us a greater toolkit, to, to put more tools in our kit that, to, that we can use to interpret what these, uh, what these things are? Or if you wanted to use an archaeological uh, uh, metaphor, for example, you kind of drop a plumb line, you know, through the different archaeological or intellectual layers if, as you try to get down to Thucydides. And you go through our own period, you start at the top, right, the, 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 in, uh, in archaeology, the deeper you go, the older you go, one layer of a city gets destroyed and another layer is built on top. So the, the, the layers up on top are newer than the layers uh, below. And you drop your plumb line down through our current period at the surface, down to the Cold War, down through the first First World War down into the pre previous periods, and, and finally you reach down there in, in Thucydides, and you realize that there's layer upon layer of, of interpretation that helps us try to figure out what are the different ways to use this book to interpret uh, our, our own uh, period. And as Seth was very accurately talking about, what is our own period? thinking about, what are we worried about, and how can we use Thucydides to help us frame what we're thinking uh, 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 about. And, and of course, this, this whole question, this progression that we had after the Cold War, we knew how to use Thucydides then. It was us versus the Soviets, we were Athens, they were Sparta. Uh, but then Sparta fell, or the Soviet Union fell. So what does Thucydides mean now uh, for, for us? Um, and, and after the Soviet Union collapsed, and you know, choose your date with the Berlin Wall fell, or maybe with the uh, with the with the breakup of the Soviet Union in, in 1989, 1991, somewhere around there, the Cold War came to an end. And after that, we were a little triumphalist uh, about that. Seth mentioned the class of civilizations, the other famous book that you've uh, probably read 
is Francis Fukuyama's The End of History. Uh, history was over, struggle was over, uh, because everybody now was a democratic capitalist. Uh, the, the Russians had become democratic capitalists, the Chinese were on their way, they had sort of given up on that communist stuff, although the party was still in power. They were, they were going to go through their own glasnost and perestroik uh, period. Basically, everybody was wanting to be like us uh, in, in the United States, and we were all very triumphalist uh, about that and, and, and quite delighted. So what did Thucydides have to say to us and, and anymore? Uh, there was no great struggle uh, going on. Um, and, 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 and so the, the, it, for, for a while, it seemed as though we were living in this unipolar moment. If the Cold War was a bipolar period, two great powers and struggle with each other, when Thucydides had something to say for us, now he didn't say anything because we were living in a unipolar, we were the superpower, we were spending 10 times as much as, uh, as uh, or we were spending more than the next 10 countries put together in their terms of their military power. We were the military great power, and there was nobody uh, to, to have a basic conflict uh, with us. So we lived in a unipolar world, and we lived in a world of of basic agreement, uh, we thought, uh, for at least a, a, a little while. And so uh, we were in good shape. But then we've started to think, you know what, that doesn't seem to quite describe our situation, and we're getting a little nervous about it. We're not feeling quite so triumphalistic a anymore. Uh, all of a sudden, there are some people who have really different ways of approaching the world, and, and then we started to, uh, to say, ah, maybe, maybe it's us versus the Islamic radicals, uh, and we're engaged in a huge generation-long war uh, with, uh, w with them. Well, how do we put that on top of Thucydides? Does that make any sense at all, uh, and, and it wasn't an easy fit. Uh, so, but but at least the, the end of history was now over, and we were back into history. There seemed to be uh, some uh, some fundamental disagreements and, and, and conflict, uh, and then we we saw Europe developing, uh, and we had an awful lot of convergence culturally and historically with Europe. But Europe was developing its own union, and uh, and it had its own interest, and we. We could get involved in a number of different uh, squabbles. It had a, a, a convergent very often, but also a very different uh, and distinct set of interests that it had. Uh, it, it all, and we started to realize we're, we're starting to move at least economically uh, into a multipolar world in which there are a number of great powers. There's, there's the Islamic world, there's Europe, there's the Asian world, or China, and there's still Russia, there's still a big, it, 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 it's, it, our, our military unipolarity started to seem almost a little beside the point. And the Chinese had shown us how our nuclear uh, power was a, a little irrelevant. You remember uh, back when we were fighting the, uh, the Korean War, Douglas MacArthur thought that he could invade North Korea uh, be, uh, because who, uh, you know, the North Koreans can't uh, you know, fight their way out of a paper bag on their own. We're, we're gonna mop up no, uh, very quickly. And the Chinese are not gonna come to their defense because uh, uh, they've just fought it uh, a debilitating civil war. Uh, they would gotten beaten up by the Japanese during the Second World War. They had seen us uh, use nuclear weapons in Japan. They're not going to fight us, uh, and, and and they did, and they and they drew the war to uh, to, uh, to 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 a, a standoff by by the end of it. But it, 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 all of a sudden, we we've started to see that we live in a multipolar world. It's not a world where we can feel so triumphalistic anymore, and people have very different views. It's not just a hard time to figure out what Thucydides meant, it's a hard time to know what do the Chinese mean when they talk to us? What are they likely to do? And they don't behave the way we expect them to behave. They do things differently than what we had expected as the Korean War showed us, as the 1969 war showed Russia. Russia never imagined that some little dispute would lead uh, to, a, to a war with China. And again, the China, they didn't understand how the, Ch 
Chinese think, uh, and, and, and what led them to do what they did, which was to fight a war with another nuclear power uh, when, when China wasn't particularly a, a, a great military power in comparison, and, and, and there we went again. So uh, we, we, all of a sudden we were fighting, uh, we were living in a world with different powers, and these different powers viewed the world differently. This is what Seth was, was trying to get at uh, as, as well. So anyway, in this current condition uh, where we have this flux of moving from unipolarity to multipolarity, what does it mean for one of these powers, particularly now China, that, what, that it has risen so quickly. Uh, I, I got to go to Shanghai a couple of years ago, which is, if you haven't been there, someday you've got to go there. It's a fabulous city. Uh, and the people in Shanghai, I got to meet with the head of the Communist Party in Shanghai, she was so proud of what they had achieved. She said, if you had come here when I was a young woman, you would have seen basically dirt streets and hardly any impressive architecture. And now look at this city. I mean, it, uh, it's really impressive modern uh, architecture and really innovative uh, uh, kind of stuff. And, and she was so pleased with what they achieved. She said, this by itself indicates within my lifetime, within that one woman's lifetime, how China has risen. Uh, and, 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 and that just by itself starts to indicate this is not the country of Mao Zedong. Uh, and, 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 and what does that mean for us? Uh, and we're nervous about this in, in the United States, which has led to Graham Allison's Thucydides trap. Uh, and so now we're using Thucydides to try to frame the discussion about what does this uh, perception, this new perception that we have about multipolarity mean for us? How are we going to try to use it to understand what we're facing with China and perhaps with, 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 with other powers uh, as well? Um, in any case, the, the, the lesson that Allison has drawn from this uh, a book of six, seven hundred uh, pages is the, the, the quote that's, that Seth read to us, which is, 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 the, is the issue of you have a ruling power, in this case Sparta, facing a rising power, Athens, and, uh, and, 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 he's, and, and, and they got into a war. The fear that it caused uh, throughout uh, uh, Greece, uh, throughout ancient Greece, and certainly among uh, the Spartans, because of Athens' rise to power, was what made war inevitable, not in our modern natural scientific point of view, but in, in, in this way that Seth was talking about. And that's really an important distinction, I think, to, uh, to, to keep in mind. Um, uh, and, 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 so, and, and that's the the, the key issue that, he, that he's looked at, and again, as Seth mentioned, he's looked at that historically. He said, okay, that's what animates Thucydides' book, and now let's look at other historical examples as we, as we pull the plumb line up a little bit from Thucydides and, and look at somewhat more recent times, if you'll think of 500 years as, as a recent period, but it's more or less the modern period. Um, and, and, and then as Seth mentioned, Allison looked at 16 different cases over the last 500 years in which at least his group identified a, a situation in which there was generally a, a ruling power. Maybe it was the Habsburgs, or maybe it was uh, the, the, the British, or so on. And, and, then, uh, and then rising powers. And, and basically, he says, you know, it's not inevitable. This is what's, uh, I, I think, actually important to remember about his case studies. But in 12 of the 16 cases, it seemed like it was inevitable that you essentially had a rear end collision. Uh, that uh, that rising power ran into uh, yeah, the classic case is Germany in, in the First World War. It was just a few years before uh, the, the First World War had broken out that the Canadian uh, uh, intelligence services uh, had written a report saying that Germany is about to surpass us, and then uh, we here in, 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 the, in, in the British uh, sphere of influence are going to be facing a problem. So, uh, so, so it wasn't just this this uh, this this weird episode of one 19-year-old kid killing an archduke in, 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 in the Balkans that led to the war. That that was a very specific spark, uh, but that was in the context of this very slow grinding rear end collision that was 
developing, and, and Germany ran into the British uh, uh, Empire, and we had to fight a, a, a world war about that. But in any case, Allison's looking at a number of cases and seeing that in 12 of those 16 cases, it did lead uh, to, to, to war. And he says, that's why we better be very careful here in our current situation. In the First World War, they thought machine guns were really horrible. And they were appalled by the use of machine guns. It seemed so impersonal, you know. I mean, after all, remember those parades at the beginning of the First World War through Paris and other, when everyone expected it to be a six month war and everyone was quite enthusiastic about going to the war. They were riding down the streets on horses. Uh, as if that war was going to be sort of this glorious uh, early modern uh, renaissance sort of uh, uh, march to glory. Machine guns blew all of that uh, away and, uh, and gas uh, and, and chemical warfare and other types of warfare uh, as, as well. But in any case, more often than not, these situations had led to conflict. And so what do we need to do? We need to be careful. We need to think very carefully. We need to engage public intellectuals. We need to engage leaders. Uh, maybe he sort of complimented that Obama and, and Xi and, and, and others uh, actually made reference to that. But they need to be aware of it and they need to think about it. Maybe it's war is not inevitable, so they'll reject it but they need to be thinking about it because we live in a dangerous situation and let's not think that we're so immune from all of these situations uh, and, and that somehow the, the examples of the past have nothing to say to us because they're a yellow flag uh, waving over us and they're saying, you better be aware of this, maybe you can't avoid it. And maybe you can be like those four cases that did not lead to war, but you better study what were the conditions that made it possible for those four cases not to lead to war and not to fall into a trap that led the other 12 to in fact lead into uh, war. Um, so uh, anyway, let, uh, let, let, let's put that aside just a little bit uh, and, and think about, well, what, what does a ruling power need to do to, to maintain uh, peace and stability? If the goal is to avoid war, uh, especially in, 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 in our contemporary age of, uh, of nuclear weapons and, and weapons, other weapons of mass destruction, uh, where we're facing a nation with a billion and a half people, uh, a, a, a nation which is rising significantly, um, what, what do we need to maintain peace and to, to, to avoid war? What can we learn from this? What are the prescriptions that comes about if you accept the idea of a Thucydides trap as Allison talks about that? What do we do with the situation of, uh, of, 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 a, of a ruling power facing a rising power? Um, well, one, uh, one prescription is, well, we better double down and make sure we do what's necessary to keep ruling uh, this because the world order depends uh, on American leadership. Uh, and after all, what, what has provided for the world order over the last 75 years or whatever it's been since the end of the Second World War? Well, we think in the United States it's American leadership. We're the ones who came up with the, 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 that discussion in New Hampshire and Bretton Woods towards the end of the war where we came up with the International Monetary Fund and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the General Agreement for Trade and, uh, and, and Tariffs. And we said we need a liberal world order based on free markets to the greatest degree possible. And, and if that can't be a global world, because unfortunately Soviets don't buy into all of that, then we're going to provide a global security network. And so we're going to form NATO, uh, whose purpose, of course, endearingly was said to, to keep the Americans in, uh, the, the Russians out, and the Germans down. Uh, so it, but, but NATO was going to do that, CETO and CENTO. We were going to surround the Soviet Union uh, with, uh, with treaty organizations, 
uh, so that Pakistan and Iran became uh, key to that because they were going to contain uh, the Soviet Union's march south. Uh, uh, Germany, of course, would, would, would contain the Soviet march uh, westward. Um, and, 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 and it was that security uh, set of institutions along with the economic institutions that created a, a, a liberal world order all in all. Uh, it's, uh, not bad, and especially after the Soviet Union collapsed increasingly then with the World Trade Organization, uh, we could start to think that maybe we really had reached the stage of, of a liberal world order instead of a liberal free world uh, order. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the problem is that we've wondered if those institutions are becoming unglued, uh, if the, if the, if the liberal world order that, that, that many envisioned at the end of the Second World War is starting to fall apart uh, now. It, it, and is that why we're having these populist movements? Uh, we've lost faith in that. The, Britain, the, the home of Adam Smith, uh, the, the sort of the Bible of liberalism, has lost faith uh, in, 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 in the global markets. And it's wanted to go towards nationalism, a very unliberal uh, uh, point of view. Uh, or, or whatever the Trump election meant, it didn't seem to be about traditional liberalism with his attack on the Trans-Pacific Partnership and NAFTA and so on. So it's, it seems as though liberalism is, is coming uh, un, unglued a, a little bit. Uh, and, and maybe we're not only moving towards uh, multipolarity, but it, it, we're, we're moving towards relative American decline uh, in, in all kinds of ways. Our eco economy seems to be weaker than it's been uh, in the past. Trump keeps saying that our military has been hollowed out. I'm not sure exactly why, but the, he keeps saying uh, this sort of Thing. The perception is uh, we're, we're not going to be able to rule well, either conceptually, because liberalism seems to be under attack, or economically and militarily. We, we are no longer going to have the elements of power which undergirds the liberal world order, because to have maintained this liberalism, we needed a strong America. We needed a Pax Americana, that peace requires a hegemonic, a hegemon. Hegemonic stability. Stability comes from there being a power who can enforce the rules. <clears throat> Um, in, in, in the 19th century was Great Britain. We had a Pax Britannica, which worked for a century, right? From the Congress of Vienna at the end of the Napoleonic Wars until the outbreak of the First World War. Essentially, the British kept more or less peace. There was Crimean War, there wasn't, nothing's perfect. Uh, but but it, there was no systemic ending war during that 100-year period. Or the Pax Romana is another famous example. But in other case, to, you need a ruler to maintain order and to maintain peace. So thinking about the ruling power is really important and that's what makes the rising power so dangerous, especially when they think differently than we do. The, 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 in Huntington's term, you know, it's a Confucian uh, culture or it's a Chinese culture. They view things differently. Uh, and, uh, and, and they certainly have distinct interests. Uh, and, th and that manifests itself in a number of these specific cases, such as what Seth was talking about, the South China, uh, China Sea, different views towards Taiwan, uh, disputes with Japan over seemingly irrelevant little islands. Uh, so, so so there's a number of different ways in which these differences have come to the fore and, 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 and manifested themselves. And, and what do we do in this situation? Is, is that the problem? Uh, Kim, you're going to have to tell me when I, you know, the problem of being a professor is, you know, you can just go on like this for, for, forever. So, so uh, I, I, I guess where I was trying to go with, with all of this is I'm really not convinced that this is the central lesson that Thucydides is telling us. Uh, I have great respect for Graham Allison. Uh, I don't think that this is the point of this 650-page book. And I think it's quite sort of 
at best beside the point to, to emphasize one sentence from that book. If you go on their website, you'll see a bunch of US senators making reference to this one point from Thucydides' book and this one point from Graham Allison's project. Uh, as if that's the whole point of this very complex book, and I don't think that it is. If, if, if we ask the question, what did Thucydides care about? What did he worry about? And then what lesson can we draw from it? I think the rising and ruling power is frankly a little bit peripheral, um, and, and it doesn't get to, to the real issue. If, if you, if, as you read through Thucydides' book, uh, what, what he's interested in is in the way that the great powers rule, whether or not they're rising or not. He starts off his book uh, observing how Athens had led a group of city-states in Greece who together as more or less free and independent cities come together to resist the invasion by the Persians. Uh, the Persians had come to conquer Greece and the Greeks wanted to maintain their freedom. Athens didn't resist, resist that all by themselves. They needed the cooperation of other states. If we want to map that on to more recent events, then, and if uh, Americans want to see themselves in that, then, yeah, we could be the Athens of, of, the, of the Second World War. We could be a leading nation in the great effort to resist the Nazis. And, 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 and it seems, as far as I can read Thucydides, that he's praising Athens for its role in, the, in, in that collective Greek action to resist the Persians, and the Persians are defeated. Uh, the problem was that Athens got a taste for leadership, uh, and all of a sudden they thought this ruling thing is kind of fun. Uh, and all of a sudden, power changes in Athens from helping to organize free and independent city-states for the sake of maintaining the freedom of the collective group. That understanding of power, where it's human organization which gives us as humanity its greatest uh, uh, abilities. Instead, it's Athens itself which wants to be the ruler, which wants to start dominating, which wants to become the hegemon. And it starts wanting to sort of be the, 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 the sort of the, well, the dictator of Greece in some ways. And it's going to exercise ruthless power and it's going to think of power in its, in its most elemental forms, military power, and it's going to be willing to exercise that military power. Uh, and, and if others are, it, it don't, uh, if others want to maintain their freedom uh, and independence, uh, Athens is no longer leading an effort to try to maintain that in principle. In fact, they're out to gain their dominance and so they start to impose their will on others. So it's the way they're rising. If they had risen as a great naval power but had their, their anti-Persian uh, uh, objective main, it continued to maintain them, if that was their character as it was beginning, but it deteriorated. It became perverted, frankly. They gained a love of domination and, and, a, and a pleasure in, in using military power power. Uh, and so uh, for, uh, one, of the, one of the usual debates which is reprinted in anthologies is the Malian dialogue. And what's so nice about that is if, 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 instead of having to read the whole darn book, you only have to read eight pages, which is really a relief. Uh, and, and, and you'll notice in, in a lot of IR uh, you know, anthologies, th if you're going to read through cities, that's what you read is the Malian dialogue. This is why, uh, and, and a lot of great uh, scholars have said, uh, what the Athenians said in the debate with the Milian representatives is what Thucydides is telling us. That's his lesson. And what uh, uh, the Milians said, we don't think you should conquer us because that's not acting very justly and the gods also are interested in, in, in maintaining the type of culture that we have. In real. And Athens dismisses that. The representatives say, poppycock. Uh, the, the strong do what, they mu uh, do what they will and the weak suffer what they must. That's the reality. Real, if, you, if you're going to be realistic about power in this very unforgiving world, you have to either bow to power or you've got to exert power. But don't talk about this mamby-pamby justice and piety stuff because that gets you nowhere. And what happens? The Athenians destroy Milos. They kill 
virtually all of the adult males, they enslave all of the women, and they take over Milos, end of story. And so people read that and they say, well, you can't, you can't argue with success. Uh, and this is just hard-nosed realism. And what's the lesson of this? Well, what should a great democratic power do? It's got to be tough in this world. It's got to use force. And if people resist it, we're going to bomb the bejesus out of them. Uh, and w by the way, the United States dropped 26,000 bombs in 2016 under the last year of the Obama administration. So that's what a democratic power needs to do, is bomb uh, and destroy me lost. Because it's either that or committing suicide like the millions did. So that's the kind of hard-nosed, aggressive realist interpretation. And, and the claim is that's the lesson of Thucydides, except by not reading the very next chapter, the next paragraph after the destruction of Milos. You sort of miss the point. Uh, uh, because what happens next? Uh, in, in the next episode, the Athenians get really pumped up. You know, it's fun to win. Uh, and it's great to destroy other countries and take over this stuff and conquer them. And they're on the roll. And they say, how about Sicily? Uh, let's attack Sicily. And there's a great debate about that. One of their generals, Nicias, says, I think it's a bad idea. We've still got this war going on here. Um, and, 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 and we probably shouldn't start another war. But if you do, it's going to be a lot of preparation, and you guys need to think very carefully about all of the equipment you need. He's actually trying to talk them out of starting another war, re reminding his fellow Athenians that this is, this is a huge decision, and you shouldn't do it. Another speaker gets up and says, listen to me. He says, do you know I was in the recent Olympics, and, uh, and my horses won because uh, I... Uh, and, and for some reason, that's the argument that wins the day. And Athens decides to start a new war. Uh, and they attack Sicily. Thucydides said it's, it, was the, it was the greatest adventure of, uh, of, of Hellenic civilization to that point. Uh, it was the greatest success for those who were victorious and the greatest of disasters for those who lost. And it was the Athenians who lost. And he said very few of their forces stumbled back home to Athens after the end of the attack on Sicily. The, 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 the end of the story of Milos is the destruction of Athens and Sicily. And then the collapse of democracy in, 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 in Athens, and, uh, and you have a transition, a regime change, to uh, an oligarchical regime in, uh, in, in, in Athens. Athens is is defeated grievously as a result of its hubris. As, as a, the way that it ruled was the problem. Um, and and it, it, had, it, had, it had wanted to become a militaristic, hegemonic power. Uh, and it thought that was the lesson. Thucydides is reminding us that's a disaster. That's the danger. Uh, he says it's not rising. It's, it's the way that you rule that matters. So what's, what's the lesson we should draw from this? And it's only when finally a, an external group, a, a group of a, a Athenian exiles, then come back and they help restore a constitution where he says where they were able to restore a blending of the few and the many. They had a more pluralistic uh, society one. They could start to recover, and this is where it's sort of an unsatisfactory ending of the book, but it seems as though Athens is being redeemed a little bit uh, by, the, uh, by the end of the book. What's the lesson? And then I've got to shut up because I've been talking too long. It strikes me that the lesson for the United States is not that we should double down and really make sure that we can keep ruling uh, and, not to, uh, and not to prevent China from rising. I mean, is, 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 is that the goal? Of, uh, is, is that the policy prescription uh, of, of the Allison uh, project is we've got to stop China from rising? And how are we going to do that uh, exactly? Uh, it, uh, or... or, 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 or it, how are we going to maintain this unipolarity when it's impossible? Instead, and, 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 and should we even try to do that? Isn't the 
the message we can draw from, uh, from Thucydides, uh, that we should really start to uh, 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 recover the liberal world order and incorporate, and, 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 and in fact, Obama was right. Obama had learned the right lesson for, from Thucydides when he said, we want to welcome a, a rising China. Uh, we're not going to resist it. We're not going to see that as a, as a road to war. Instead, we want to incorporate the Chinese. We want to find ways in, in which they can achieve their own national greatness and to overcome a century of humiliation. In, in the United States, we love to study the 19th century. It was an age in which we formed a continental republic. The 19th century is a, is a, is a century of humiliation for China. They had foreigners uh, invading and occupying. The British twice carried out opium wars in China, in which they humiliated the, the Chinese. The Chinese want to be a great power, and, and in fact, the response to a rising China is to recognize the Chinese greatness, not to resist it and not to fear it, and not to talk about, well, we might have a war with you if you are going to become a great power uh, a, a, again. That's a very complex uh, uh, objective uh, because, uh, but what we need to do a little bit is what the Germans have done. And that's one of the cases, and I'm, this I'll close. Let's study the German case since the 1990s. We just had the German students come in. And you look at the way Germany is exercising leadership in Europe right now. They're not doing what they did in the first half of the 20th century. Instead, what the Germans are doing, and it has caused some anxiety in other places. Remember, Margaret Thatcher complained to George Bush uh, that uh, Germany was trying to achieve economically what they had tried to achieve militarily. But she missed the point, because Germany has adopted the liberal principle Principles. They're a democratic state, they like free markets, they don't like national borders, they want the free movement of goods and capital and labor uh, through, throughout Europe. They, they want to lead a, a, a process in which Europe as a whole can prosper and some of those hostilities can start to diminish uh, over time. That's the goal uh, for the United States is how to make a transition to a multipolar world in which a strong, there's a strong Europe, there's a strong China, where we can see the recovery uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of Russia, perhaps, from, from how it's fallen a, a, a little bit. But in that sense, the message of Thucydides is not realism, it's traditional idealism. It's about international organization. Uh, it's, it's, it's about collective security. These are complex uh, uh, goals. Uh, they may fail. We may end up with a, an aggressive, militaristic, authoritarian China confronting us. Uh, but um, uh, it's not inevitable, but it might become inevitable if we emphasize the Pax Americana hegemonic stability realist interpretation of Thucydides and misunderstand that the trap that Thucydides is warning us against, the trap is a love of domination. Enough of that. Thank you. <laughs>